What's cooking in Seoul, London, Dubai and Mumbai? Now on BBC World News, flash photography throughout as Colleen Harris introduces Global Pulse on food. Welcome to Global Pulse, a series that takes you on a tour of some of the world's most exciting, vibrant and creative cities. We'll be exploring different places and eating up the energy and ideas and meeting the inspiring people that are forming the very ingredients of global culture. This edition of Global Pulse is dedicated to food. We'll be whisking you off to Seoul, the capital of South Korea, to experience the wonders of Asian cuisine. To London for an exclusive interview with Michelin-starred chef Mark Hicks and his staff. Then off to Dubai to tantalize your taste buds with international and eclectic dishes. And finally, to Mumbai to find out about a brand new dining experience. Let's go to the capital of South Korea, Seoul, a city that's teeming with culinary creativity that crosses religions, creeds, colours and cultures. In a moment, we're going to talk to Wu Kwan, a Buddhist nun who teaches cookery at the Kumbira Cookery Centre in Bongyong Temple. Bongyongsa, 바루 공양이라고 해서 법 공양을 펴요. 그래서 바루라는 것은 음양기라고 그래요. 다른 말로 무슨 뜻이냐면 자기 양에 맞게끔 덜어서 먹는 음식이기 때문에 실제로 어, 버림이 하나도 없고 그 사찰 음식이 주는 교훈이라는 것은 어, 우리 몸에 불필요한 걸 덜어내자예요. 그러니까 실제로 불교에서는 탐진치라는 게 삼독이라고 말하거든요. 욕심내고 성내고 어리석음 이것이 실은 삼독의 세 가지 독. 근데 우리가 먹는 문화도 마찬가지예요. 실질적으로 내가 필요한 만큼만 먹어야 되지 욕심을 내게 되면 소화 불량이 되죠. 그러니까 소화 불량으로 인해서 몸이 불편해지니까 짜증이 나죠. 그 짜증으로 인해서 결국은 어떻게 돼요? 남에게 또 피해를 끼치는 어리석은 일을 하게 되죠. 저희가 불과 20년, 30년 만 해도 다이어트라는 말이 없었어요. 그냥 먹고 사는 일이 급급했고 배부르는 게 우선이었죠. 근데 불과 20년, 30년 사이에 먹는 게 굉장히 이제 늘어나고 많아진 거예요. 양적으로든 뭐 질적으로든. 그러다 보니까 실은 너무 많이 먹게 해서 먹어서 오는 이제 병들이 생긴 거죠. 여러 가지의 뭐 이유가 있겠지만 실질적으로는 몸이 아파서 그리고 뭔가 식생활에 좀 개선이 필요해서 실은 그런 분들이 제일 많은 거죠. 그런 사람들에게 올바른 식문화를 소개를 해줘야 되고 착한 음식이라고 그러죠. 제대로 된 음식 이런 것들을 알려줘야 될 의무가 있기 때문에 우리 그 이제 종교하고 상관없죠. 기독교인들도 오시게 되고 천주교인도 다른 종교인들도 많이 찾아오세요. 오늘은 네. 치나물, 도토리 몽무침 이렇게 음. 네. 화전까지 해가지고 할 거예요. 네, 네. 요새 보면은 서양도 그렇고 다 패스트푸드 에 익숙하잖아요. 네. 이건 전부 다 슬로파. 이 매실 액기스도 보통 백일은 있어야 저 액기스를 짜낼 수 있고 이 소금도 네. 간수 빠진 게 3년 이상은 되어 쓰거든요. 아. 그래서 이 방울 도마도가 네. 우리 집 간장 간장하고 아. 조화롭고. 음. 되는지 맛이 
직간장 한 스푼에 네. 매신 두개 그리고 고춧가루는 이제 개인의 취향 들기름 한 스푼 음. 네. 깨소금 조금 넣어주고 음. 아까 썰어놓은 얘를 넣어주고 방울도마도 토마토 그래서 요치나물고 살짝만 버무려주면 돼요 우리 네, 맛있을 것 같아요. 네, 손님들이 좋아하는 음식 중에 음 하나입니다. 이 도토리 목과 치가 네, 하나 완성됐고요. 네, 하나 완 그래. 이거는 아 찹쌀가루입니다. 찹쌀가루. 화전할 건데 이쪽 면이 익었을 거 아니에요. 네, 네. 그러면 이거 지면 이렇게 쌀에 쑥 들어가거든. 그래서 꼬치 한 거를 또좀 발라주고 위로. 이렇게 하면 이제 뜨뜻하기 때문에 꿀이 녹아서 네. 저절로. 실제로 우리 인간도 뭐 겨우 자연의 일부일 뿐인 거예요. 자연을 벗어나서 우리가 삶을 영위할 수. 실은 전 세계를 통틀어서 어 저는 개인적인 제 소견이긴 합니다만은 사찰 음식처럼 훌륭한 음식이 없다고 생각해요. 런던, a world in itself, with more restaurants with Michelin stars in Europe apart from Paris. Tokyo has the most Michelin stars in the world, by the way. Good to know for your next pub quiz. Mark Hicks, the celebrated Michelin star chef, has taken on yet another responsibility. As you can see, it was a Victorian tram shed in the sort of late 1800s. Well, I've always kind of known a lot of the artists and um, collected a bit of art and always exchanged uh, food for art. But it's an old-fashioned sort of Parisian or Berlin thing. Uh, a lot of the artists, you know, in the old days couldn't afford to eat, so they would exchange their work with restaurants, you know, so therefore restaurants would have a you know, great collection of art and, and the restaurants would be full of artists and collectors. In my head, I sort of had a, you know, a cow's body with a chicken's head or something, or vice versa. So I texted Damon Hurst, my friend, and during the meeting, and about two days later, he came in and had a look and then sent me an image of the tank with the cow. When we took this building on, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I just didn't want to do another menu like the other restaurant. So I thought it had to be something quite specific. The concept of the tram shed is, is simplicity of beef and chicken. So we offer a whole chicken, about 1.4 kilos, for 25 pounds. So that's to share between two or three people. Beautifully roasted and then finished on the char grill, uh, served with chips. I thought, you know, let's make a feature of the chicken, you know, name the breed on the menu and use one producer for the chickens so that general public would actually know the provenance of the chicken. These are Indian rock, that's the breed. We just, it's very simple, just a small score on the thighs and on the top part of the leg. And then we just do it with the rock salt and the rosemary, a little bit of vegetable oil, and just a light seasoning of the rock salt and the, and the rosemary. And then we just roast them on a tray in the, in the oven for about 35 minutes. And then finish them on the grill, so they're nice and crispy. And like I said, nice and simple, but it's all it's the, the integrity of the product. We've got a fantastic beef supplier in Northern Ireland uh, who ages the beef in Himalayan salt chambers, which takes a lot of the bad bacteria out of the atmosphere and helps to age the beef. So we have about three different cuts of beef. Which I'm going to show you. So we've got the rib, rib on the bone, a sirloin, and a porterhouse, so that's a little bit of fillet and sirloin as well, with a bone running up the middle. We're looking for about a one kilo portion. That's nice and simple, nicely char grilled. And that's the one kilo rib. You know, people's perception of British food is that, you know, it's very simple and boring, but I think, you know, with the fantastic ingredients that are grown in this country, we can create some very good, exciting dishes, very close to sort of Italian and French food.
That's not the dumbest thing I think I've ever seen. When Jenny Stepien walked down the aisle this weekend in Swissvale, Pennsylvania, the man whose arm she held was not her father, because her dad, Michael, was gone 10 years already, snatched from his little girl's life in a murder. So who was this person walking by her side? A person she would not even meet until the day before the wedding when she had to talk him through the route to the church? Well, 10 years ago, Arthur Thomas was in urgent need of a new heart, and the heart they gave him was Michael's, Jenny's dad's. And then like a vacuum to suck the body. to take you to Al Ustad, a restaurant that's known to virtually all of Dubai. It has a fascinating history and the food is simply glorious. We are the oldest restaurant in Dubai, if not the UAE. There are third generation families who come here. 90% of Dubai knows about us and have eaten in this restaurant. My father, he was born in Iran in 1933. He'd come in 1941. You know, World War II was there and they had to come to Dubai in a boat, searching for food and a better life. Dubai was uh, small. There used to be no butcher shops. There's you no know, kitchens and all that time, you know. There's even no roads, no water, no airplanes, no car, no electricity. That's how his life started, started into different types of businesses. Then in 78, he took a 100,000 dirham that time loan. And he said, this is my last thing in Dubai. If I can win this, win it. Otherwise, I'll go back to my country. And from then on, we are doing better as the day passes by. Now, we serve a simple Iranian cuisine. We stick to the main Iranian dishes, like chili kebab, juju kebab, kebab masti, we use anywhere between 80 to 150 kilos of meat and chicken every day at the restaurant. Because of the social media, much more business has started. Nowadays, the expatriates have become much more, like about maybe 20, 25%, because uh, they want to eat, obviously, good food, as well as to see a piece of history, you know. We do have uh, royal highnesses. Our food goes to their palaces. We have gone to all the houses in Dubai. I mean, there's, I guess, very rare people who have not eaten our food. These are, uh, we have a lot of pictures around, but this wall is uh, the celebrities who've come to the restaurant since the 80s and 90s. Uh, just to just name a few, uh, there's Salman Khan, uh, John Ibrahim, Anil Kapoor, Nana Patekar. These are Indian actors. And then we have uh, towards the Arabics, like uh, Hussein Al Jasmi, Daoud Hussein, Faiz Saeed. That's the uh, UAE head coach, Mohammed uh, Mehdi Ali. He's Jenny Morris. He's a famous worldwide chef. When my late father, he passed away about three months ago, good customers, they came outside, they called the paper. They said, This gentleman who's been here for 70 years plus. Uh, and they all wrote about my late father in the paper. In Dubai, you find a lot of places with, you know, more of beautiful designs and all. But uh, our kind of thinking is to stick to the old Dubai and to obviously, above all, to maintain the quality which we have done it for the past 37 years. This is a big thing to continue this legacy. Kibara was formed, you could say, a lifetime ago, and it started off in a cave in Beirut. We wanted to establish that idea through our cuisine, through our architecture, through our design. You can tell by the space that there are carpets and wooden elements that feel like a cave-like feature. The building wasn't made for Kubara at first. Norisan, our designer, looked at it and he said, I can create something magnificent here with the Arabian feel. Think Prince of Persia. We're in the desert, we wanted to give that desert slash palace look. The hand-carved wooden features, which we actually showcase 3D mapping on. The 3D mapping actually plays with you. And as you enter, of course, Kubara, you have the writings on the wall from Khalil Gibran. 
Downstairs is the restaurant element. As you can see, the, the building is a round structure. Upstairs, we have a lounge element with private dinings because it's very popular in the Arabian world to have a private dining room. So we created uh, about three of them in a babel room. And our cuisine, we mix and match the Western side to our uh, Arabian methodology. Our cuisine was very limited. It was too traditional. And we kept seeing fusion concepts coming around the world, mixing and, and matching the Japanese, the Peruvian, the Italian. So we decided, you know what, let's try it with the Mediterranean feel. So Cubaro was formed. I think all our dishes are sophisticated to a level where none of them are replicas anywhere else. So we, every day we explore a new dish, every day we explore a new idea in terms of our culture, how we can elaborate it more, expand on it. We're raised here, so we had the whole uh, inspiration at home. And the chefs came and visited us, and we have a Syrian uh, chef who actually understands the culture. So what are we doing today? One of the um, Kibara signature dish, chicken busan. We'll start with um, the white onion, thin slice. We're gonna move now to the fire, start to cook the onion. Some molasses, some tomat. Reduce the fire and just keep it cooking. Yeah. Okay, now we start with the busan. We just need to boneless, take the old bone outside and start with the marination. Sumac, sumac powder, and then we have thyme, we have olive oil, and we have garlic, cardamom, and we have salt. All what you can do, put all these ingredients inside the machine. I, I want it to be like really smooth, so when you eat it, you don't feel this like tough pieces of thyme. And then all what we do is just take the busan and just leave it in the fridge for like at least minimum two hours. Right. So now we transfer to the bread section. That's it, just try, try to get it like round shape, and then it's ready to go. Take chicken from the fridge and grill the chicken. Not gonna take too long, baby chicken maximum take like four to five minutes after you grill it. Just cut it and throw it in the oven and it's ready to go. So I have the bread ready after I bake it, but just nicely, and then I have garlic paste. And then I have my lionese onion, the one I already cooked with the pomegranate molasses and sumac. Take the busan again. Now, just arrange the chicken in very easy way, nice. Ready to go. It's amazing how Dubai started off with a few nationalities about 20 years ago, and now we're up to every nationality. We kind of adapted and met what Dubai has given. So everybody seems to be coming. It's time for us to give them something and go to them and showcase what we have. We have a lot to say about where we were born, where we were raised. Growing up here, I've seen nothing but love and uh, everybody sharing and equality. And I wanted to really give out the message uh, that uh, this is who we are. We're off to Mumbai. Mumbai is a place to be reckoned with, filled with gems, art, music, fashion, and of course, incredible food. We're going to investigate Bori Kitchen, where people come in to eat and go out as friends. Every dish is described to the customer, its origins and traditions. My name is Munaf Kapadia. I'm the chief eating officer of the Bori Kitchen. Every Saturday and Sunday, 10 to 12 people who come for our six course meal. I talk about the culture, I talk about why we eat in this big plate, why it's a community dining experience, and then the meal starts. And one dish at a time, I get a dish, people finish that dish, and then we move on to the next dish. These two things are thals. Okay, Bori is conventionally sit on the floor and eat food from a thal. Before we start our meal, we start by tasting salt. It's because it activates your taste buds. At the same time, it cleans your palate. By tradition, the youngest person in the respective thals gets to offer salt to everyone. Bori cuisine is a combination of many cuisines. Like, we have come from Yemen, so the Mughlai food is also influences our food. Then from Gujarat, the Gujarati food. We have modified all those things and we make our own food, like, so... It's a very different taste from all the others. And ours is a slow cooking thing. 
It started off as an experiment by a son to keep his mother busy on weekends. She used to spend a lot of her time just watching television. I wanted her to use her time more productively because she's a talented and very ambitious woman. So I thought about it for a minute and both of us realized that she's a fantastic cook. And the food she makes, it's not easily available to people outside the Bori community. This is probably my fifth or sixth time and um I have no intention, unless my belly tells me otherwise, to stop coming. So I'm really happy to kind of continue patronizing their fantastic food and Auntie's wonderful cooking. In that one and a half hour, two hours, everyone's got in my number, they're friends, you know. TBK is a perfect example of what it means to run a family business. Okay, it's my mother. Nafisa Kapade, she's a chef, okay, of the Bori Kitchen. Now she's a mini celebrity chef in Bombay. I'm enjoying it. Like, suppose if I have to cook one same thing repeatedly, then it might get a little boring. But since we are having different menus, I love it. My father, okay, was a hardcore businessman. Why? Because he does the very important role of sourcing the right ingredients. 70% my mother's skill and talent, but it's 30% the kind of ingredients he sources. And the amount of effort and uh, goodwill and credibility and relationship that influences the food he buys. They don't work on margins, they work on the fact that my father's been going to them for the last 10 years. The fact that my father's gone to their weddings, you know, he knows their children. The Bori Kitchen, for the very first time, created a brand and a product and a service that was relatable to non boris and that's how I, that's the reason I think the Bori Kitchen is successful. Take a look at the latest trends in our weekly fashion roundup. I'm Anand Cabra. I'm a designer and my style it's more about Indian androgyny. For me it's all about pushing uh, boundaries. So the trousers I'm wearing is an adaptation of the salwar which is worn by women commonly in the north of India. The waistcoat that I'm wearing is uh, of late more associated with politicians of India. Tan shoes which are bought from Zara. These are bangles. It's all in silver. It's become almost like a passion of mine so I keep on collecting it from every country of the world that I visit. The bag is my uh, schoolboy fantasy, so I'm carrying a satchel which belongs God knows when. My name is Akiyemi Akiropo, and I'm a filmmaker. I believe fashion should be eccentric. These are Roberto Cavalli glasses. This coat I got from a thrift store. The shirt is Ralph Lauren. The belt is Cole Han. The pants, French Connection. And then the shoes. Some nice Chelsea I got in Italy. I don't know what they're called. This is my sport wristwatch. It's like my everyday baby goes with everything. The two chains, uh, the gold and the silver. My mom gave me the gold and I got the other one from, uh, from somebody. In the next edition of Global Pulse, we'll be exploring the world's most exciting creative spaces. We'll be going to Connex in Buenos Aires, Seoul DXB in Dubai, and The Hive in Mumbai to discover some wonderful platforms for the creative scene. We'll also be stopping off in Seoul, South Korea. For more on food and other Global Pulse stories, go to bbc.com forward slash travel.